Uh, so again, good afternoon, everyone watching online. Welcome to the B&H event space. Before we get started, we'd really like to thank B&H for this opportunity. It's our first event here, and we're super excited. I think we have a great event for everyone, which we've entitled Mobile Storytelling, How Smartphones Have Changed the Way We Create Content. So we're going to talk a lot about types of content that you can create with smartphones and digital storytelling. But first, I'll do a quick intro about Samson so you can see who we are and where we've come from and kind of why we're hosting this event. I'll go over some digital storytelling and where it's come from and where maybe it's going. And these guys that you'll hear from later will tell you even more about that. Then I'll show you the Samsung Go Mic Mobile and how that can incorporate into your content that you're creating. And then we're going to start off with some of our special guests. We have Shannon Kaysen, who's a podcaster and storyteller, and he'll talk about how he got into that and uses mobile in what he does. Then we have Jaime Rivera, who is from the Pocket Now Media Channel. They do a lot of reviews on, on a blog, on YouTube, and it's an independent company, and he'll talk about YouTube production and video production. And then we have Tim Poole, who's a leading mobile journalist, and he's going to talk a little bit about what he does, how he got started, and the tools that he uses. And then at the end, we will have a Q&A session. So if you have any questions, feel free to write them in. We'll have someone reading them to us, and we'll answer as much as we can. So here we go. So who is Samson? We started in 1980 as a wireless microphone company. We've been making wireless for now for 37 years, um, always trying to find solutions and needs for content creators. And we've always tried to design with that purpose. And one of those purposes has been video production. So really, from the beginning, we made wireless mics for cameras. And back in the day, it was big camcorders with cassette tapes that you have to you know, carry on your shoulder. Then we had pro cameras. Things started to get smaller. And then, as I guess we got through the 90s and into the 2000s, you had these kind of handy cam micro cameras. And our wireless technology also shrunk down. So this system, our airline micro, the receiver and transmitter were both about the size of an iPod, had internal rechargeable batteries. So you can just throw it in your bag and be really ready to run and gun at a moment's notice. But then technology shifted, and we got into DSLR cameras. And now you can really shoot high quality video, 4K, from a camera. Then at the price, um, the entry to the barrier really came down. So everyone can shoot and really kind of compete with these big media outlets with a camera that only costs maybe a couple of thousand dollars. And we released our Concert 88 camera system, which is a low profile system that just fit right on top of a DSLR camera. It's great for videographers, or again, if you're doing an event, you're going to a conference, need to be a run and gun guy, perfect system. But then things shifted again. iPhones, Android phones, cameras kept getting better. There's apps for streaming. And people started to create more video with their phones. And the question came up is, I want to have be wireless with my phone. There's wired mics, things that are tethered or plug in. But I really want to be free to move around. I have a wireless phone. Why can't I have a wireless mic? And we had our Stage XPD1 system where the receiver was small enough to fit in a USB stick. And with a camera adapter for the iPhone or an adapter for Android, you can be completely wireless now for smartphones. And we started to get this product out. b &H was a uh, big push behind this as well. And we started to build a community of users. And people gave us some feedback of really what they're looking for when they're shooting mobile. And that led us to the Go Mic Mobile, which is really the first professional wireless microphone system made for smartphones. And I will go more in depth in this in a couple of minutes. But first, I want to talk a little bit about digital storytelling. And this quote I found online about it being the practice of everyday people who use digital tools to tell their story. And that's really what it's all about, is having that idea, having that story, and getting it out there. And where we kind of started with that is maybe with podcasting. And Channel talk more about being a podcaster. But around 2004, the term podcast enter our vernacular. It was a portmanteau of iPod and broadcast. Adam Curry, the VJ from MTV, he started to be uh, started a podcast called the uh, the Daily Source. It was really the first serial podcast. And then in around 2005, iTunes allowed you to subscribe and sync your podcast with your iPod, still having to plug everything in. In 2006, we released the first professional USB studio microphone. Uh, so what that allowed you to do was plug directly into a computer, and now you didn't need to build a recording studio in your house or know how to be an engineer. Anyone could just plug in, hit record, and now you sound like a broadcaster. And then a few years later, we, or 2007, a year later, the iPhone came out. And then a few years after that, 
the apps came out so you can subscribe to podcasts from your phone. So now you could self-curate, you could binge, and now the audience grew and the demand grew. So it was a huge opportunity to create and build content and get it out there. So that's kind of where we started, and then video came into play. There was Vine videos and Periscope and YouTube and Facebook Live. So we saw this shift happening, and with one thing, we saw with mobile filmmaking, and in 2015, Sean Baker, a director, made an entire film using iPhone 5Ss, and it was premiered at Sundance Film Festival. And with three iPhones, and he used Filmic Pro, which is an app for the iPhone, he was able to produce this movie. And if you, don't, if you ever want to get into filming on the iPhone, check out Filmic Pro. It's under $10, and it turns your phone, Android or iPhone, into a really powerful camera, it gives you the full features that any camera any like DSLR or pro camera will have. So that's where you can really go with it. But if you're looking just to make your own channel, you want to have a stream from your house, a cooking show, you can do that now with Facebook Live. Twitch has an IRL channel in real life. You can broadcast straight to YouTube. And the nice thing about doing this, this content on your own is that there's no, there's no format that you have to follow. If you want to make an hour and a half show, go make an hour and a half show. As long as people are watching and you understand what your audience is looking for, just go out there and do it. And that's what's really exciting about where we're at with content creation. And another area that's really new and it's this incredible medium that's happening is mobile journalism. And this again has really been the outgrowth of uh, mobile phones and social media. And Tim will talk a lot about that and I'll show you someone else that's doing some more of that as well. There's a community, if you go on Facebook, called Hashtag Mojocom. And if you're interested in getting into mobile journalism, I'd tell you to check it out. And it's a lot of professional journalists. And they show best practices or what new technology is out there. And it's really just a nice, close-knit community. And they're sharing a lot. And this does lead us to the Go Mic Mobile. And really, could be in anyone's still because it's, it's such a wonderful device. This, again, is the first mobile system for smartphones. And you can see just there's a couple of components. You have a receiver that clips onto the back of the phone, we have a handheld and a belt pack transmitter. So let me just go through quickly the features so you can see how it can tie into what you're doing. So one professional quality audio, and what that means to us is it's, it's uncompressed audio, it's clean signal, there's low latency. So if you're filming, you don't have to go back and worry about sync issues. You're not going to have to align everything. You could film, you could stream, it's just a quick, easy way to integrate into your project. The receiver has a rechargeable battery. You're not pulling any power from your phone. You got 13 hours of runtime on it, and you can plug a power bank in if you want to film longer. I don't know how, you know, if you need more than 13 hours, maybe you do sometimes. You never know. Uh, you can get up to about 100 feet of operating range. So a lot of mics that are out there right now, they're tethered to the phone and they plug in, and you have maybe a couple of feet where you can be away from the phone. Or if you turn the phone to shoot something else, there goes your audio. So now you are really completely wireless. It fits, uh, we give you the uh, adapters to put onto the phone, onto a tablet, onto a camera, onto a tripod. We really, again, the community gave us a lot of feedback and said, this is what we need. And we said, OK, we'll put it in there. So you get every adapter really necessary to make this work for your situation. And the really cool part is the receiver works with two transmitters. So now one, you could be mic'd up as the, the host, and you could have a second subject on camera and both be close mic'd. And you could have an interview. Or if you're at a trade show or a conference, you could always be mic'd up and then passing a handheld mic around and interview people that are there. And we also we give you all the cables, iOS cables, Android cables, audio cables to work with your DSLR. So there's nothing else you really have to buy. Everything just comes right there. And it's really easy, to, again, to get this professional audio for your mobile video. And this is where I get to this question of, oh, oh not yet, I'm sorry. I will show you quickly how it all connects. So we have, again, it mounts onto the back of the phone. And it plugs right into the lightning port. So many phones now are losing the headphone jack, you need to get in digitally. This goes right in there or into the Android, the USB-C, USB, -C, USB uh, micro B. We get you all of that. Mic up your subject. You always want to make sure you get the mic close to their mouth. You get a nice clean level, but you don't want to be intrusive into your video. So if someone's having a hand, holding a handheld, make sure it's like maybe a couple of buttons below their, uh, below the collar, just so you'll just see the top of the mic when you're filming. <laughs> 
get a good strong level. So in both transmitters, there's a trim control. So you always want to get as close to clipping as possible so you get the best signal to noise, but not clipping. So on the receiver, you'll have signal LEDs, and if you see them flash red, you'll turn that down. The handheld has an auto gain, so if you do move off mic a little bit, it'll still keep the level pretty level, you know, keep it pretty even. And then on, it, on the receiver itself, we also do have a final uh, volume fader, and this is like any last minute tweaks. And like I said, many phones now don't have headphone jacks. The GoMic mobile receiver has a headphone jack so you can monitor what you're recording, and this way you're not guessing what's going into your, uh, into your video. And then you just hit record. So whether you want to produce, again, a, a cooking show from your kitchen, you're doing an interview from a remote, you want to live stream, this now works with all that. It works with Facebook Live, it works with Periscope, it works with the native camera app in your iPhone. Android phones, because of the nature of how Androids work, some of them might work natively. You might have to get a, this free apps called like Open Camera and a few others that we have listed on our website that'll just integrate right into the Android phone. There's no extra cost there, though. And you can really just record and have great sounding quality audio. And this will bring me to my question of how important is good audio to video. And everybody always wants to get the best camera and spend a lot of money and make sure the lighting is right. And Yusuf was saying, you can always fix that. But if a video is, if it's pixelated or overexposed, we can deal with it. If it sounds bad, you might want to leave that channel and go to find another show. So here's a quick example of us using GoMic Mobile right down the block at the Javits Center at NAB a couple of months ago. My name's Tina and we're here at NAB to do a quick GoMic Mobile demo. What you're listening to right now is the audio quality with the GoMic Mobile plugged in. And this is what the audio quality is like with the GoMic Mobile disconnected and just the audio quality of the iPad's internal microphone. So I'm sure we've all heard, watch videos that sound like that with all that background noise. And again, you're a couple of feet away from your device and that's how bad it could sound. So if you're at a conference or you're at a trade show and you want to capture what's going on, that's what people are hearing. How long is that audience going to stay connected with your channel? So really good audio is more important or just as important as good video. We can get by with, again, with if it's pixelated or out of focus, we can deal with that. But if you can't hear anything, why am I going to watch? So again, the GoMic Mobile is an easy way to integrate into whatever format, whatever device works for you. We're not going to tell you what's the right one. If you're a, a DSLR guy, you like filming on your tablet or your smartphone, it will integrate with all of those. Can we give you the options to mount it? So this is really a nice way to get up and running easily. And what that does is it leads me to some of our experts here, as I like to call them. These are guys that use mobile technology in everything they do. We have Shannon Kaysen, a podcaster. Like I said, Jaime Rivera, YouTube personality, the best thing to call you, I guess, really right now, uh, and Tim Poole, a journalist. But first up, I'm going to introduce Shannon, who Shannon, we met at a podcast show, podcast movement a couple years ago. And the more you learn about Shannon, the more you're just blown away. He's an incredible storyteller, been on uh, WNYC Snap Judgment. We, my, my family's heard about him through The Moth, which if, if you haven't heard him on there, definitely take a listen. And if you listen to their 500th episode that was released this year, the lead story, and I mean, they say incredible, such incredible things about Shannon. Uh, Knight Foundation grant winner. I mean, it just it goes on and on with what he's done with podcasting and storytelling. And he's got a great podcast called Shannon Kaysen's Homemade Stories, which I also encourage you to check out. And so without further ado, I'd like to bring up Shannon and let him tell his story. Thank you so much. Are you, is he, make sure you're on. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I uh, I had lost everything, but it wasn't the first time. It wasn't the second time. Third time? No, nah, it wasn't the third time. <laughs> Fourth time? Wasn't the fourth time. It was the fifth time. Now there was one time after that. So it was a sixth time I lost everything. But it was the fifth time I had lost everything that I said, like, man, forget this. I'm just gonna start telling my story, sharing my stories. I don't know if people in this room, people on the internet, if you lost the, everything. One time, 
I don't, I don't know. Maybe you have it, you know, good for you, good for you. Well, really not, though. Because it isn't until you lost everything that you really feel gratitude like I feel. I'm just happy to be here today. I'm happy to be at, at B&H Photo. I used to look at the catalog at this place, man, just all the time. I'm Detroit hip hop. We used to look at this all the time and, man, I want that, I want that, I want that for Christmas, I want that. So maybe you haven't lost everything before, you know, so good for you, good for you. <laughs> It wasn't like it wasn't my fault, though. I gambled. I sat down at that blackjack table, and those weren't chips on the table. That was my wife, my three-month-old baby girl, my house, my car, job, the life I knew. I got to remember that that's what got me into this thing of storytelling and podcasting. I got to remember that. And I know I always get too deep. You know, I get too deep in a lot of the, <laughs> a lot of the things I do. And I get too deep on my podcast, Homemade Stories, as well. But I want to talk about podcasting and audio because mobile Storytelling, storytelling on our smartphones is how I kind of got into this. One of the reasons I got into this. So I'm going to tell a little bit of that story and share some stories with you. So homemade stories started when I had lost a job. I was, I was just telling you about it, gambling in the casinos, and I lost a job, and I'm out of a job, and I always love writing. My mother would always tell me, boy, get in the, start writing, start writing more. But I didn't like rejection, so I didn't send my writing to a lot of literary journals. But I, 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 had, I had notebook paper or, or printer paper, and I had staples, so I started a zine. And a zine is pretty much copy paper and a stapler, and you print some, some words and thoughts and story, in my case, stories on it, and you can sell them at zine distros and those things. And that's how I started, homemade story zine. That's my first zine. But then, just being real with you, I won some money at the casino. <laughs> Won about, won about $3,000, and anybody here who got some addiction problems, you know, like, if you, if you win or you do something, you got to get that out of your hand before you just give it right back to the casino. So what I did, it was, 19, it was uh, 2009, and I went and got me an iPhone. So I spent about $600 on that, gave the $2,400 back to the casino, and, uh, <laughs> and I have my iPhone. Now, I like, I, like, I like talk radio, I like sports radio, I like all those things, and on the iPhone, I saw they had this thing called podcast. So I started listening to the podcast, and I'm like, now I come, I come out of Detroit hip hop, we used to produce stuff and just work with all kind of equipment. Whatever you can get your hands on, you'll work with the smallest equipment, like Casio keyboards, whatever. And uh, I'm like, I can do that. So I'm listening to Mark Marin. I'm listening to uh, uh, the New Yorker Fiction, listening to, uh, who else I was listening to? New Yorker Fiction, Mark Marin, and uh, it was another one too. But I'm like, I can do that. So I went home. I got a. Um, I went to one of the places like BNH, which was in Chicago at that time, and I bought a microphone. But my hands are big, and I kind of got a little forceful with the microphone, and I broke it. But I started a podcast called Homemade Stories. Where, where my microphone at? That's my microphone. That's my first microphone. I broke the stand, so I just put it on a Folgers coffee can. <laughs> Detroit hip hop, you make it work. You make whatever you can work. I mean, even the podcast cover, you know, I put that together myself. That was back before they had a lot of, uh, you had to have a certain, certain digital quality. I made that myself, and I put a lot of stories in it, you know, little story ideas. So I made that from this microphone. And from this microphone, just a little, I don't know, I probably spent $30 for it or so. 
I would use that microphone in a free program called Audacity to put together my stories. And people started to like my stories. People started to listen. Then NPR shows wanted to tell, wanted me to tell my story. I did it from that microphone. Everything I did from that microphone, I was doing from, from that little microphone. But then uh, uh, WBZ took interest in, in my stories. So Homemade Stories in 2014 and 2015 was distributed by uh, WBZ Chicago, which is a, one of the biggest public radio stations. And uh, it, was, it, was, it was really fun working with them, and I still continue to work with them. And they were able to kind of show me some of the details of, of putting a podcast together, getting great audio, and I got a better microphone. I was able to do that. People still continue to love my story, so I started working with the moth. I know I look like I'm singing an oldest Redden song right there or something. <laughs> but uh, started working with the moth and traveling with them, telling my stories. Also, uh, Snap Judgment, which was one of my favorite uh, radio, radio shows and also just some of my favorite people. So I started working with Snap Judgment on a lot of their tours and a lot of their storytelling that they did in their podcast and, and, and radio show. And, um, and that's been my journey as a storyteller. And I have a new show that's coming up in February or March with WBZ Chicago. It's called The Trouble. And I'm interviewing people who have gone through these vulnerable moments in their life. Maybe they are some of those people who have lost everything. Some, we, we've talked to uh, people who've taken kickbacks in jobs and just getting the other side of the story from people because everybody, you, you can be painted as a monster, but usually there are some monsters out there, but sometimes it's other, everybody ends in a cardboard figure like that. There's more to it and just digging into those stories because I'm interested in those stories and those are the kind of stories I love to tell. I mean, my, my, he talked about my moth story. My moth story is about stealing $50,000 from my job at a grocery store bank and, and losing it all at the casino, which kind of started my podcasting and storytelling thing because uh, f try finding work after that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I, I got to laugh about it, you know. So that's my story of podcasting. Now I want to talk about um, some things with mobile podcasting because mobile storytelling with your smartphone and the smartphone technology and the sound of it has taken on, has gotten so good. Has gotten has gotten so good with uh, with a, a, a lot of things. So <laughs> that's, that's fine. That's fine. If y'all can take it, yeah, yeah, yeah. But see, that's I record everything. So I'm recording right now. I'm recording my 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 talk, and I record so much of everything, and it's easy to do with the smartphone technology, because if it's anything that everybody has in their pocket, we got our phone on us, and we're playing with it. So I, I, I record a lot of conversations. I, I use those within my podcast, because my podcast, Homemade Stories, is like tied so much into my life, and I play a lot of things from my life. And with good sound, like, like, um, like the gentleman was saying on, on, the, on the screen, Sound means so much if you can get that good sound. And these, these microphones on the phone are so much better, but when you can add on to bring more richness to the sound, it helps. So I record pretty much everything when, I, when I'm working with my podcast, because the phone can become a podcast studio. That's, uh, I don't have that one yet, I got the seven plus. I haven't, I, haven't, I haven't won that much money at the casino yet. I, I've, actually, I've stopped going, so. so. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I want to I wanna play something where I recorded everything. I was, I, 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 w I was blessed with a microphone, one of these Go uh, mic mobile systems from Samson, and I, and I wanted to use the thing. So I, I put my, um, my nice little flag on this, and I went out into the streets of Detroit. That's where I live. I came in today from Detroit. And I went out to the streets of Detroit. We had our first big snow yesterday. So it was the first big snow of the year. 
And I just kind of want to take y'all on a little journey of a homemade stories episode. I'm gonna I'm I'm take you on a journey of a homemade stories episode and stuff that I recorded with my Samson Go mic. I can just unplug this and put it right in? Yeah, cool. Anybody been to Detroit? Here? Huh? Some Detroit? Oh, cool, cool. Cool, good city. Y'all should come visit. It's a lot of good, great things going on in Detroit. I'm happy to see so much great movement in my city. But uh, I went out, did a little recording, and uh, so I'm gonna take you on a journey through my podcast. And this is how I do my podcast too. I'll uh, talk about everyday life, everyday things that happen to me. So, welcome to Homemade Stories, bonus Samson Gold Mike edition. Today was a big snowstorm in Detroit. The snowstorm alert is at the bottom of the TV while my wife Cindy is watching Dr. Phil. Why does this guy know everything? Does he ever say, I don't know what to do. Why do these people tell all their business on a TV show? Then I remember I tell all my business on my podcast. And I <laughs> <laughs> I'm going out. I don't want to play with this go mic system Sean and Samson hooked me up with. In the snow. Why not? I turn on my car, turn on the heat then sweep the snow off the car, then scrape the ice off the car. I get the whole car. I hate when I see these cars drive down the street. It's a, like two feet of snow on the roof of the car. I get the whole, I, I try to use my, my, uh, my broom to get the whole car. Then I get in the car wet and uncomfortable because I did all that. <laughs> I got this new all wheel drive car time to play around with this baby, see what it can do. You have to drive a car to see what it do in the snow. That's very important. You want to know how it's going to slide, how it's going to slip, how it's going to work around the other. So my new car, I had to check it out. I'm headed to downtown Detroit to find out if the people in Detroit are out enjoying the weather. So this is me in the car with my go mics. Let's see if it works. Yeah, it works. Let me turn it down. It's cold as hell out here. I'm in Detroit. We got a snowstorm. We should be used to it, but I mean, this is the first one. So the first one is always the most vicious, I suppose, because you come out of no snowstorm and you all snowstorm. So um, I'm about to weather this storm and see why people are out in this shit. Excuse my language. My language with my podcast, with my podcast going. Uh, I pressed the Uber app because why not make some money on the way downtown? This Uber is going in totally the wrong direction, but I'm going to go because I don't know how to press cancel. This is how little I drive Uber. I don't even know where the cancel button is. Now I got to go all the way back this way. Well, maybe they have a good story. I figure I'm gonna get some, some stories from my Uber drivers. I mean, my Uber riders. I stop at a house that's way out of the way. I wish I would've turned off the app, uh, but there's a young lady who jumps in my car and asks if I, and I ask if she'll talk on my podcast. And I'm gonna stop her because she start getting into it, but. So, it's a blizzard right now, it seems like it, huh? Yeah, kind of. It's nothing for Michigan, though. No. It ain't nothing for us, right? No. I was, Because I was going to ask, like, what, what's, what's bringing you out here in this, in this, in this bad weather? What you, what you have to do? Well, you know, I'm off tomorrow, and I had took my son's TV up here like two weeks ago and pawned it because he was being bad. So her son was being bad, but she really goes in on him, so I cut that off because we're going to keep this PG, she said. <laughs> So she really started going in on her son, telling me all the, all the stuff he did. People would tell you so much stuff. You give them a microphone, you put a microphone in their hand, and they just, they start going to town. So, um, um, 
You got to have a TV to watch in a snowstorm. I totally understand. Now I'm headed downtown. Now, I always get kind of nervous before I put myself out there to ask random strangers questions. But it's like swimming, though. It's hesitant when you first jump in the water, but once you're in, you're in. I'm still wet from cleaning off the car anyway. Someone, as I'm getting out, asked me for change, and I asked them if they were talking to the, into, my, into my microphone, and uh, this is what he says to me. This, so winner, winner in Detroit, love it, hate it, what's up? Uh, I, uh, no comment, no comment. I need, I need, I need a few dollars. If you didn't hear that, he said, no comment, no comment, I need a couple dollars. <laughs> so I, I stopped him, because I, you know, I'm like, hey, you just asked me for something, and I'm asking you for, I didn't have any, any money on me, I would have gave it to him, you know. I said, I asked you for something. Hey, why, why, why would you turn me down? You, you would want me to give it, to, you know, and I was like, that's not, that's, that's not good karma, man. You, you, should, you should help people if you want help too. That's, you want to help and you receive help. But I continue walking on. So I stopped these people who, uh, this one's pretty interesting. This guy act like, it's a group, there's two guys. They act like they don't want to stop me at first, or stop for me at first. Hey, can I ask a question for my radio show real quick? Just real quick, just real quick. Winner in, winner in Detroit, you love it or hate it? What's love. It? This is unbelievable. It brings people together. You love it? Yeah, love it. Why are you out here in this, in this cold? Loving life, man. Loving Experience life. in the city. Life. You city. from here? Yeah, buddy. From here, born and raised. That's what I'm and when he said born and raised, I always smell... BS sometimes when people say born and raised. You know, any big city, when you're around a big city, but when you're really from it, you kind of got to call them out a little bit. So I, I kind of I kind of stay on him a little bit. Um, uh, yeah. Southwest Detroit, where are you from? Um, well, I live here in Capitol Park. So. Capitol Park, that's yeah. born and raised. Where are you born, or, born, born, and, born and raised? Born in South Line, then White Lake. Not my man. Yeah. I was doing. I was like, okay, you live in Capitol Park now, which is right downtown, but born and raised, where, where, where are you from? Exactly. My man, good to see you guys. Enjoy the time. Yep, enjoy the winter. Then I stopped somebody, and I knew this guy was from Detroit. I knew this guy was from Detroit. Man, why you out here in all this cold? Hey, man, you know, I got to get this money, baby. Got to, right? It's Detroit City. That's what we about. <laughs> <laughs> I love it, man. Thank you. Yes, sir. Absolutely. All right. So I knew he was born and raised in Detroit. Got to get this money. That's one thing that's very important. Detroiters are big time hustlers. They will make, make money in a snowstorm. So uh, I saw a guy who was smoking a cigarette and I stopped him just to talk to him. Where's he at? Because he was pretty interesting. Yeah. Can I ask you a question for my radio show real quick? Sure. When in Detroit, you love it, hate it, I indifferent? It. I love it. Love Music, it. techno. Born here, man. It's like amazing. You can always find a spot everywhere, every night of the week, that has a spot to dance. Techno is bumping in yeah. the winter time with the snow coming down. Oh, cold yeah. outside. Oh, people yeah. gotta. People wanna. Uh, people standing in yeah. line. <laughs> people, people just wanna like just dance and like get warm and like drink and it's part of like the culture here. I love it. You partying? You partying this week? Uh, yeah, actually, I got a party this week. Do you? Okay, sound yeah, like I you do. promote parties. I do, I do. I promote Ian Ayasa DJ. That's what I'm talking about. Um, we're doing a late night. What's your DJ name? Uh, Tyler, just Tyler, T-Y-L-R. That's what I love. Yeah, that was just keep, yeah, it, right? keep it normal. Yeah, yeah, keep it normal. I don't know all this crazy, like, <laughs> numbers and everything, yeah, yeah, hashtags, yeah. like, no. You meet creative people. The thing is, you start putting yourself out there with a microphone. Now, I'm gonna do this all the time because I just love this so much. So I'm gonna add these, these things into my podcast because I like going out and talking to people. And it's good to be able to good, get good audio to do that, you know, and know that I'm getting good audio every time I do it. So that was wonderful. But the guy who asked for the change, he was like, he saw me walking around, having a good time, stopping people with my microphone. He saw me from across the street and kind of flagged me down. So I went over to him to talk to him, and uh, he had an interesting story, too. When, when, when in Detroit, you love it or hate it? Uh, I, I like it, even though I'm sleeping out in it. You sleeping out in this yeah. cold? By the steam vents in Greektown. Uh, check me out by the parking garage. They don't have no, uh, no spots for you? 
uh, there's shelter. The, the, uh, you know, I stayed at Operation Get Down for a few years. I just got tired of waking up at 5 a.m. But this kind of gotcha. sleep is like torture. Yeah, yeah. Everybody want their own and to do their own thing. You don't want to be woking up at five. I, I get that part, but this is cold. Right. I would I would get up at five for this. Yeah, it, be, it, 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 it beats not being able to get to sleep at all because it's too cold. Yeah, 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 so. yeah. But I, hey, thank you, man. I yeah, appreciate no, no, no. it. Yep, stay warm. Stay warm out here. All right, yeah, okay. all right. Yep, try. yep, yep. You make it. You yep. got it. Yep. So really, a cool guy. And, and, and he saw me out having a good time, and I wish I was able to give him something, and if I see him again, I, I, I would help him out. But, uh, but that's the thing, like, like being out, doing things, activity kind of kind of breeds more activity. People want to be around it. People want to be, because people was like flagging me down, seeing me out there with my microphone, and I love that, to be able to do that, and to have a system to be able to do that. So that's definitely something I want to add, too. Um, Okay, so I, I said it was cold enough for the day, and this is he me headed back to my car. And let's see, some guys, it some guys cold stopped as hell me out here. I'm about to get out of this cold, cause I'm uh, yeah, I'm about to have like nubs for fingers in a second. I ain't wear gloves. You see that in the picture? Don't expect too much. <laughs> What's up? Happy Hanukkah. Happy oh, Hanukkah. The winter in Detroit, you love it? Oh, Detroit's really nice, man. Detroit, you been enjoying your Yeah. Time? Yeah, enjoy the winter? Very nice. Yeah, yeah. Happy Hanukkah. Happy Hanukkah. Hanukkah. Winter in Detroit, you love it, hate it? Love it. Love it. Love crazy it. winter. Love it. Just crazy. Yeah, you guys have a good time. Have a great celebration. Long? Yeah, I'm just running. Hey, so the uh, main thing in Hanukkah is that we... You know the whole the whole concept is to spread the light, spread and that's light. that's what we're doing here. I love it. Spread, continue spreading that light. Yeah. Spread the light. Light is love, right? Huh? Yeah, yeah. Take care, guys. And that's my first snow in Detroit. Thank you for listening to podcast <laughs> Shannon Cason's homemade stories. All right, so some other things. My setup. How I set up my podcast. Um, it's called Homemade Stories, so I do most things at home. Even when I'm with WBZ Chicago, I work out of home, and I'm able to transfer files to them and just work from there. So most things I do from home. And this is my setup at home. I have a few microphones that I work with. I work with um, the Shure SM7Bs, of course, and then I got. Um, um, different mobile stuff that I use and, and having interviews and mostly wanting to have interviews and people come to the office and work on stuff. And it was a big step up from my last my last podcast studio. This was this is this is all I used for, for many years. For about probably the first 60 episodes, got my deal with WBZ Chicago and, and worked on so many different shows with that. But I was happy to get a, a grant from the Knight Foundation to, to do live shows, but also to be able to uh, get better equipment as well. So so that, that's, that's my setup. I always love looking at people's podcasting setups. That's one of my things. Like I, if I see something in the paper or if I see, I'll, uh, I'll you know, uh, screen capture, just to kind of see how they set up and, and, and get some ideas from them. So I always like to share, share my setup. But, uh, my mobile gear that I go out with mostly, um, I'll use a, I use a GoPro sometimes, uh, just to, for myself, just to kind of have video and different things. And in this Zoom recorder, if I'm if I'm interviewing people on the road, is able to hook up the XLR and hook up a microphone to be able to have interviews when I'm out on the road or um, at someone else's house, so if someone else's homemade stories. But this has been like a. a a little God seeing for me because uh, I love that. I love, the, I love, the, I love the, the simplicity of it and it works well. You're just plugging in and it works real well. So I'm looking to put that into my podcasting um, repertoire more and more. And the iRig 2, which, is, which hooks it up and, and able to put sound from my, from my microphones into my phone if I wanted to go into my phone if I'm if I'm trying to do something mobile as well. But I use my 
my iPhone as well, I use the recorder on that to like record things like this. And I've used those recordings actually in my podcast as well. So just being able to record everything is very important just to have the mobile gear available to get good sound or to get some sound and then to get better sound as, as you get these add-on, add-on equipment. And those are the, um, that's my mobile, my mobile strategy. So some final thoughts from my storytelling, my mobile storytelling, and this may, this may not be legal. <laughs> you know, you know me from my stories a little bit. This may not be as, you know, but uh, don't ask permission. So stop asking permission so much. If you got the microphone in your hand, just go up to people and talk sometimes. You don't have to do as much attention. Because sometimes if you ask the permission, it gives them time to hesitate. They want to talk, it gives them time to hesitate. Don't ask permission, just jump out there. Um, that's been important for me. I do that a lot, a lot. Because I'll talk to family and I'll record. They sick of me recording everything. Everybody's sick of me. They're like. Can we just have a Thanksgiving dinner without you with the, with the microphones and, and all this thing? But these are memories. They're going to love these things eventually. You know, if somebody has to document life. I use Tape -a Call app. It's one of my favorite apps for uh, recording phone calls. So I record, I got a daughter who lives actually here on the East Coast, and I record our conversations just for myself, you know, just, just so I can hear her voice when I don't, when I don't see her, or maybe we had a great conversation. I, hey, is it legal? I don't, I, you know what I'm saying? But that's my daughter, so I'm gonna record us talking and, and, and having our conversations. And I do it a lot with, uh, I'm able to use that on the podcast, but this is from a mobile device, being out on the road. And everything I recorded on here, if you heard it, I was in a snowstorm, folks. By having good equipment in a snowstorm, I'm able to get decent audio. That's, that's a big deal. Um, I use my phone recorder on my phone for a backup copy on all things. I'm always recording. I don't know, like people come to, go to, we go to these storytelling shows, we do shows all over. And nobody, like friends of mine who storytellers, they don't record, I record everything. Because I wanna go back listen, see if I did a good job, see where I was unclear, see where I can get better. And that's one of the things you, you can do is listen. And I hate listening back to myself, but having it is, a, is an important thing for, for growth. Um, create a labeling system. That's very important if you're recording everything or if you're using mobile devices to record things. Because you go, you're gonna be able to share those things with with, uh, with your drive or also with your uh, Dropbox. But if you just leave them in the phone, they can take up a lot of the memory in the phone. So one of the things that I do immediately after I'm done recording and I press save is I'll label it. So I'll label BH Photo Samson. And I have that and I remember this experience, but I'm able to go back without looking at all these dates and trying to figure out where you have to, everybody who's in the audio knows when it's not labeled, man, you put yourself in a spot. I'm sure in, 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 in video and in photography as well, you have to create a labeling system for yourself. Like you can follow some other people's labeling system, but you find a labeling system that works for you and use it. And, um, Record your loved ones. I, I mentioned that a little bit earlier, but record them just because. You ain't gotta ask permission, that's my mama. You know what I'm saying, that's my dad. I went in my dad's room and uh, you know, dad's got a room. Always dad's got some room, you gotta have a room. So I go back in his room and we sat in his, uh, his lazy boy recliners in his room and I, I had some homemade stories mugs and I poured us some Hennessy in the homemade stories mugs, you know. Gave my dad one and we sat there and talked and I, I listened to my dad and I recorded him with a mobile device and I got stories that I had never heard before. I'm 40, 42 years old and he, you know, my dad's old dad's, he, he, he don't share everything, but me sitting down in that Hennessy was working on him. And he just started opening up the books for me. And we talked for three hours. 
I recorded it all, and I was able to put that into a podcast, and I'm thinking about making a podcast with him. My dad is one of the coolest guys you ever meet. I mean, just in general. He's, I'm, I'm corny. He's the, like one of the coolest dudes. So, so, but having the mobile strategy helped me to get that. And that's three hours of just priceless stuff for me because he told me about the 67 riots in Detroit. He talked about uh, old cars that he loved. He talked about uh, women. And I was wondering, these women, because it wasn't lining up with my mom. I'm like, well, my mom? <laughs> what? You know what I'm saying? I was, But he was sharing it. So I'm, I'm listening to these stories, but it is it, 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 powerful stuff. And I, I recorded my mom. And I like to share this as I, as I close because I want to hear about the uh, the the video and the uh, journalism as well because those are things that I'm interested in in branching out into. I mostly use audio for my mobile uh, storytelling and for my for, for my podcast, but I would love to to use video more and and to show people. So that's one of the things that I'm looking to learn for 2018 and learn by doing, I should say because I just got to jump out there and do it. That's how it works. And no matter what the equipment I have, you know, I, I make it work with what I have. So, but this is, I went to my mom's house and my mom take care of my grandmother. She's passed away this year earlier. And uh, me and my mom, we just love each other's company. So I sat down and I had my, I had my phone and I had a mic hooked up to the phone and was able to talk to my mom and just ask her questions. I was asking her about, because I was doing an episode on bicycles, and I was asking her if she had a bike. And I just wanted to, it, it, it went in a direction I wasn't expecting. We never had a birthday party, never had cake. You know, cake, you know, everybody wanted cake and ice cream. The birthday came and we didn't even, no honor, no nothing. That didn't happen. <laughs> you and Uncle, they didn't get no birthday? No, but no, we knew we were in love, but they didn't believe, you know, uh, they didn't do that. That's why when I had you all, I wanted you all to experience everything. Because uh -huh. I, I probably was experiencing it myself because I didn't have that. I didn't have, for Christmas, we got uh, an orange, an apple, and some walnuts. <laughs> <laughs> And I love those moments and to be able to capture those moments. And I put that one on my podcast and I got a bunch of emails from people just saying like they were touched hearing my mother talk about that experience because they had had that same experience. So um, if you get anything from what I'm saying, record your loved ones, record somebody you care about, record, record everything if you can, but record on the go because you're going to get some things that's going to be so valuable to you yourself. And if you can share it with others and help them have that same experience or remember uh, relating experiences in their life, I mean, that's, that's what we're doing this for. That's what we're recording these things for, to touch people. So uh, thank you so much. I appreciate you. Well, thank you, Shannon. And again, <laughs> storytelling thank and podcasting is an incredible way to just get your idea across. And again, the spontaneity of being able to take your phone and just go out there and record, it's, it's really amazing what you can do now with just an idea. So to shift gears a little bit, I'm going to introduce Jaime Rivera, which he is part of Pocket Now. Like I said earlier, it's an online review outlet. Um, it's an independent uh, venture. It's a small group. And 
these guys are competing with huge companies like CNET and able to really get an audience almost the same size. Uh, 1.5 million subscribers to their YouTube channel, 580 million views on their YouTube channel. I mean, it's just tremendous numbers. And when I started talking to Jaime a little bit, he's like, oh yeah, it's just like a couple of guys doing this and filming every day and creating every day. And I just, we wanted to bring him up here to talk to you a little bit about how to create videos, how to build a channel, how to take an idea and grow it into something even bigger. So I'd like to pass it on to Jaime here. Okay. Um, can you hear me? Yep. All good? Um, oh my god, I am, I'm so flattered by, by number one, being here, being the opportunity to listen to your story. Uh, we we kind of share a couple of things. Uh, but uh, here's the thing. It, I wish I could stand here and tell you that uh, what we started in 2007 was uh, was a dream that we sat down and we jotted down and we envisioned, and it actually wasn't. Uh, we kind of snowballed into success on YouTube. And we actually began as a publication, and I'll show you a little more on that soon, but because this is more about storytelling, um, we, we started our YouTube channel because we would review phones. We would review technology. We wouldn't make any money out of it. Uh, there was, at some point, and just to give you a little preamble of, of my backstory, I studied business administration and I'm a licensed flight dispatcher. I was in charge of the operation system of an airline. And the reason why I got into mobile technology was because these, I, I remember that we would have to dispatch of, uh, an aircraft called a Cessna 208. You'll probably see FedEx cargo planes that still use it. And when you would have to calculate how much the weight and balance for these flights, you would have to come up with these numeric equations uh, to calculate the, the, the center of gravity. And I remember that pocket PCs had just come out, and I'm sure mo most of you remember Palm Pilots back in the day. And I remember in the case of the pocket PC, the reason why I drifted to that was because um, it had Excel. And so it gave me the opportunity to have these Excel equations on the PDA. And I remember when I came to the, to the dispatch team and I showed them, I'm, I'm like, just go with this to the ramp and just add these numbers here and it'll calculate everything automatically. And I remember this guy, he was 50 years old. He was like, I'm not gonna do this. And eventually he ended up doing it. And he came back and was able to reduce his work from, we would take around 15 minutes to be able to do the calculations to about 30 seconds. 15 minutes to 30 seconds. And so, it literally changed our operation. A mobile device changed our operation from being able to dispatch, it would be pretty much four flights in a span of an hour, to dispatching six flights in 10 minutes. This is how it changed everything for us. And so I started getting all these pocket PCs and I started hooking up the team and dispatch to be able to use them. And the problem was that I bricked one of them. I, I ended up ruining it. And I remember that I, um, I, uh, Started. I used the website back then that was pretty new. It was called Google. I, I'm sure you, you've heard of it now, but back then I'm talking 2002, 2003. I started Googling over how to fix this product, and I landed in a, in a forum called Pocket Now. It was run by a kid in Philadelphia. He was 23 years old back then, and he was just doing it for love. He was just. He had this forum. They, I actually wasn't able to fix the Pocket PC. But I landed into this awesome community of people that were really passionate about mobile technology. And so it gave me the opportunity, I remember he wrote down one day and he was like, I'm looking for writers, is anybody interested? And uh, I was like, hey listen, I, I live in Honduras. I'm, I was actually not in the United States back then. I live in Honduras, uh, I'm sure it's gonna be really hard for me to contribute, but I've got good English, I think. Um, and I think I can help out. I mean, I, I actually use these products from a real world perspective. I don't just talk about them, I need them for work. And so he was like, sure, why not? And uh, I started writing reviews and then something came up called YouTube. And YouTube back then was just a video repository. It was, it was this idea from a couple of kids that ended up being acquired by Google and uh, I was like, oh my, he's like, do you have a camera? I'm like, yeah, I, my security guy's got this camera that we use to take photos of the things that, you know, theft problems or whatever we have, so let me borrow that camera. I was the manager of, back then I was in UPS Airlines. Um, and I grabbed the stack of books. 
I set the camera and I, I grabbed the phone and I just filmed with the lighting from the top of my kitchen. And that is our video number two. His was video number one. That was 6,300 videos ago. Um, and here's the thing. It's amazing how mobile technology evolved. And I love that you mentioned the iPhone. Uh, you know, I started doing videos on, on weekends. I still had my day job, started doing videos on weekends. And because my specialty was business development, I guess I did a couple of things that actually ended up landing us money. We started making money. It started generating revenue just out of the blue. And, and we were, we were kind of shocked. It, was, it wasn't really the reason why we were doing it. It was just the opportunity to uh, you know, engage with people and talk about products. And so I, we started working with, with uh, you know, we started doing these videos. And then out of the blue, uh, my country is going through a lot of uh, crime and a lot of problems. And I, I was nearly killed leaving my job. And it was because of the lack of security that I was kind of forced to leave. I was forced to leave my job and I, I was working in the highest tier airline, so I wasn't going to step back. And I was like, you know what? I mean, we were already starting to make money. What if I started doing this full time? And uh, I remember my ex-wife got, she was like, she was enraged, like, you're crazy. You have no idea what you're doing. And I was like, listen, I mean, we've grabbed, we've grabbed so many concepts, so many ideas, and I feel that this has a future. But back then, when I would sit down with people and I would tell them that I would make YouTube videos, I was frowned upon. People would make fun of me. It, it's still to this point in, in my country, when I go back and I sit down with people and I try to explain what I do, it's just code for me not being able to admit that I don't have a job. That's the way they look at me. <laughs> That's the way they look at me. And so it's, it's funny because you know, it eventually snowballed and growed. And I guess, I guess it was the fact that I did it out of need, that I, you know, it's, it's an opportunity to be able to serve people with our honest opinion on a product, because that's really what, what's helped us grow. We, we remained in that niche. That's the reason why we were called Pocket Now, because of Pocket PCs. But we remained in the mobile niche, where all we talk about is mobile products. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it was, we, I guess, Focusing on that niche is what's really helped us. There are a lot of people on YouTube that will focus on very different things, but I guess because we focused on just one thing and we try to do it really well, uh, and the cool thing is we don't really get paid for what we talk about. Companies send us our products, and what we do is we tell you, and because I actually use these products for work, I can tell you from an honest opinion. I mean, a lot of products come out and they tell you that they can uh, scroll the screen with your eyeballs and whatever. The question is, how much are you actually going to use that? In the real world, are you really going to use a phone for that? They don't know what it's like to be le to leave from the 42nd Street stop in Bryant Park, trying to jungle that huge phone while you're wearing gloves and trying to figure out your way to get from point A to point B. If you're not a New Yorker, they don't. These are the real things that people do. These are the real things that people care about, and that is how we created the channel. We created the channel on that idea. We want to make useful content for real people, people that are really going to use this. And I guess that's the reason why we grew. It's Right now, it's 1.4 million subscribers. We get around 6 to 7 million views a month. Um, and I remember, I guess one of our flagship products is what I do every day. I make a daily video. And so I remember when I told a couple of friends I'm going to make a video every day, they were like, you're nuts. You have no idea what you're trying to do. You have no idea what you're trying to do. There is nobody in YouTube that does one video a day. And so I was like, I saw somebody on CNET. I, I, I highly recommend it. It's, it's a show called The Apple Bite from Brian Tong and CNET. That was the inspiration for the daily news video that I do, where I saw all the animations and all the, all the chroma key effects that he does. And I remember seeing that, and I remember sitting down with a friend of mine that was, that was working in television, and I, was, and I told him, I want to do that. And he's like, you have no idea what you're getting into. There is no way you're going to be able to do that. And I'm like, well, mathematics was kind of my thing. Mathematically, the only way I'm going to be able to grow this channel in a way for it to provide enough income for my family was if I did a video a day. I did the numbers. That was the only way to grow, a video a day. And he's like, dude, you can't. It's just impossible. And you know what? I, I love it when people tell me that something is impossible. Uh, I'm like, watch me. 
The first video took me 12 hours to produce. And here's, the, here's one of the important things and one of the main reasons why when I was invited to be part of this, I felt that I, I, would, I would be flattered to be part of this group. It's mobile technology that's allowed this. It's mobile technology that allows me to produce eight videos a week. I'm b between eight to nine videos now. And I don't have a producer. I don't have an editor. I don't have a camera guy. Back then when I saw the whole effects on the video, I was like, what is that? How does he get all those animations behind them on the screen? And so I started Googling, and it was like chroma key. Huh. What's chroma key? What's a green screen? It's like, so I went downtown, and I looked for this green cloth. And I remember setting up the camera, and I was like, OK. So I started using iMovie back then, and I tried to figure out chroma effects. And I'm like, wait a second. This can't do that. And then I learned that you needed to edit video in layers. I had no idea. And I'm like, oh, Final Cut Pro. What is Final Cut Pro? So I actually invested in Final Cut Pro through my severance. I had to buy a little bit of a more expensive computer. I had to buy a better camera. Back then, it was a Canon T3i. Um, and these are the products that allowed me to take the show off. And it started off as just me with the, with the green screen at the beginning. But then I noticed that people didn't really like the videos. And one of the things that I noticed was that, and that's the reason why we started investing in audio. One of the biggest hurdles in YouTube is engagement. The most important word, the most important factor is how engaging is your content. And if you watch a video and it sounds like if you're in the bathroom, people will not take you seriously. And that's how our first video sounded. So uh, I remember when, I, when, I, when, uh, uh, when you reached out about the Go Mic Mobile, I, you know, we, in the, before that, we were using this wire connected to the camera. And cameras are great about video. They can do audio as well, but it's not the same as if you use a product that's dedicated to it. But then we didn't have the versatility, and we had these problems. We would go to CES, or we would go to Barcelona at MWC, and we would have to stand at a certain amount of, of distance from the camera, but we had this wire in between us. And so, sure, the audio came out great, but the problem is that people would walk in front of the wire. They, they broke like four wires in, in the span of at least three shows. And so for us, that versatility, I was like, oh my god. I, I'm like, listen, I, I don't, I, I'd actually be willing to do whatever just because I need the product for work. It enables me to be able to do it. And it's all because of mobile technology. Who would have thought that your phone would be your audio amplifier? Who would have thought? I mean, I make videos with an LG V30 and a DJI Osmo, and people don't know that I'm using a mobile phone on 24-bit sorry, 24 frames per second, high bit rate video being recorded from a phone. And people don't know that most of my vlogs come from a phone, the stabilizer. And you just need a couple of elements to have people, again, take you seriously. Number one, no jitter. That's the reason why we invested in the stabilizers. Number two, believe it or not, I mean, I, could sh I wish I could show you a graph. Sadly, it, it, was, I, it wasn't available at the moment. But the moment we started, the simple fact of connecting good audio to the video was a huge spike in our subscriber growth, just because we stopped looking like a second tier channel, and we actually started looking professional. Audio was the biggest source of engagement for us. I highly recommend, for those of you that are starting in YouTube, if you're new to it, you have no idea the potential there is. You know, just the simple idea that you're allowed to tell your story, and you know, Obviously, you get paid for it. I, I would have never dreamed of that. But you know, it's not really about the income. It's about, we go back to your story. It's about telling stories. And we've evolved our product into that, into ways to tell people not just why the iPhone 10 is important, but what comes behind it and why these changes allow it to be crucial, important at the moment, and why you should also not buy it, what things are probably not necessarily for you, and why it's probably not a good investment for you. And we love the fact that because we are not being paid by any company to do that, we have the liberty to be able to provide you our honest and biased opinion of why and the reasons why. Um, so I guess just press the. It'll come up. Oh, sorry. Here we go. So this is our website. Um, 
again, it started as a, as a forum. It eventually evolved into a, a website. But you know, one of the most shocking things for people, and what people don't really get, is we are, we are a very small operation. We're just a couple of guys. Uh, one of them, uh, our editor-in-chief, is in Romania. He's going to pop on, pop on on the next screen. That's Anton. That's myself. We have Juan in LA, Jules, who's our news editor, Adrian, Joe, Adam. This is really us. Our YouTube channel is literally just two people, just Juan and me. So it is possible for any of you that want to try it out, it is possible for you to build a lasting presence on YouTube and to cr share your ideas with just two people. And we've got almost 600 million views so far. We started October 14, 2007. Um, and what do I use? Retina MacBook Pro, 15 inch. Uh, we use solid state drives because it, we record a lot of video, a lot of content. Uh, Retina MacBook Pro is really, and I recommend the 15 inch mainly because of the quad core processing if you want to export a video quickly. And the process is very simple. We, you know, we go through the news uh, and uh, go through the news and then literally just come up with a small little script. I pretty much improvise everything. It's not, it's not until the case of, uh, of like more you know, elaborate reviews where I actually go through a defined script where I record all the audio. My camera of choice, believe it or not, is still a Sony a6300. You can buy this camera for $1,000. It records in 4K, down samples to, uh, sorry, in 6K, down samples to 4K. But what I like the most about the camera is, again, we're on trade shows everywhere, and we really need something that's crazy portable. And it's funny, what allows us to, this is being recorded on the DJI Osmo, by the way, using an iPhone 10. What you're seeing right now is an iPhone 10 on the stabilizer. This little tripod head, $140, will help you get like the smoothest spans you could think of. And these are things that weren't available five years ago. And then the most important, again, audio. I would highly recommend, if anything, I wouldn't even invest. Obviously, the camera is important, but you can start with an iPhone. What I would recommend that you don't pass out on is the audio. Really, it, it makes just the content so much more engaging. And I love the fact that I could just snap it on the iPhone 10. Snap the product, here is the green screen, which is now not as cheap as the one that I was using so many years ago when I began. Snap it on, and uh, by the way, I use some crazy t-shirts. I swap t-shirts every day, and these are all pop culture tees that I use. But this is really it. This is really the setup. This is the DJI Osmo, again, an LG V30. This is really all you need to get your job done. What's stabilizing? That's a DJI Osmo. Uh, but there are far less expensive options. Uh, this is just, again, was, was the one that was available, and then there have been a few new ones that have popped up recently. Um, it, again, it provides you just the versatility of being able to walk around. And you, I would, it's shocking just how easy it works and how quickly you can just stabilize your way in and out of something. Again, just using a phone. You have three cameras to choose from here. So whatever options you want from whatever angles, that's the reason why I recommend this phone most to be able to start. And this is my daily news video. Uh, we invested on graphics packages. Um, eventually, obviously, as we grew, as we were able to grow the product. But this is pretty much it. Again, it's, it's been a labor of love. It's been a really big opportunity for us. But again, it was, it was all just the fact that things snowballed as technology started evolving. One of the most important things, again, once you figured out all the part about the products that you want to work with, the products that you want to talk about, one of the biggest challenges is, again, the story. People really do care about, we go back to the topic of engagement. People do care about how you engage with them. It's funny, but I show people a graph uh, over our audience retention, because that's one of the most important things in YouTube, is are you able to retain the audience to continue watching your video to the end? You don't get paid for view. You get paid per watch minute. And so how do you actually get the person to sit down for three minutes to watch your video? Because I don't know if you've noticed this, but every time that you click on a YouTube video, what's the first thing that you do? Skip the ad. Skip the ad is the first thing. The second one is you notice how long the video is going to last. Do you really have the time to watch the video or not? So I remember when I came up with the idea of doing the, of doing the, 
the daily news video, the first thing was I didn't have time. One of my biggest challenges is I didn't have time to watch the video. And so I was like, huh, so what kind of video would I be willing to watch? It has to be short. It has to be straight to the point. It has to look good, and it has to be good enough to engage in, it, to engage in me being able to, me being willing to watch it. So, you know, I came up with a couple of samples. I came up with a couple of tries. And then this is what ended up coming up. It's called the Pocket Now Daily. I hope you watch it. <laughs> I, I, can't, I can't say that I'm, I'm the best uh, storyteller or that we're the best storytellers. But one thing that I will tell you is that, you know, mobile technology is just getting started. This is just the tip of the iceberg for what's coming. We've seen companies evolve in things like artificial intelligence. We've seen companies evolve in just the miniaturization of technology. Again, I started with a very heavy camera. I can now use a smartphone, and it can provide very similar quality in video. There have been cases where that time that they ripped our microphones a couple of times, the LG V10 had just come out, and that phone could record good audio as well. And that was our backup plan. You would see a couple of videos of us holding a phone. You know, but again, we go back to the challenge of how can you, how can you compete with CNET? How can you compete with all of these companies? And you know, it goes back to the way they look, the way they portray themselves, and the way they tell their story. And for us, just to be able to, you know, clip on a little microphone and not have to be strapped to a camera, to have all that separation, and for me to walk around and be able to tell a story, and to also be able to interview people directly with the same audio source, because synchronizing audio is another can be another nightmare that doesn't necessarily always work, or sometimes Final Cut will tell you that it's synced, but it's really not. And so, and so we go back. The tools are literally everything. Um, I remember probably just to end my presentation. One of the most, you know, one of the most beautiful milestones for me is again. I grew up in Latin America. I watched channels like Telemundo and Univision, and for me, it was really amazing to sit down uh, many years ago when we began. Again, this was like 2012 when I started doing this, you know, it's full time seriously. And I was sitting down in the same table with the people that I admired and watched on Telemundo. We were all editing our videos for the same trade show that we were being part of. And I was like, oh my god. I guess we really did do this right. You know, but it's it's again, it's it's been a, a shocker for us up to the point where I'm standing here in front of you and I feel that I'm probably, you know, I'm probably not the, the best person to be up here. I feel very flattered, very honored to share our story. Uh, and again, this is just the tip of the iceberg. Whether we like it or not, everything is gonna go mobile. You know, right now it's content creation. Right now it's how we tell our story. But eventually you have no idea how much things are going to continue changing. I remember when, when I used to work in UPS, one of the things that changed everything for us was simply the fact that people were able to track their package. That made a complete difference from one company being just another package retail, uh, transporter to being the monster that it is, information. And to now be able to have that information and share it for you, I mean, you get on a plane right now, you don't see those big rigs of, of these people scanning your bag tag on the other end. You see them use a phone. Mobile technology is really the way to go. I, and I believe that's... Leads us to our final presenter today, Tim Poole, who is really an amazing person also in mobile journalism, or just journalism. Uh, got his start streaming 21 hours straight from Occupy Wall Street on social media and a mobile phone, uh, a founding member of Vice News, been featured in so many international news agencies. And this is a guy that really has shown what you can do with journalism out of a backpack, a one-man band, really the shift in journalism, what's happening as an independent journalist, as someone who's been in some of these independent channels, and, and even now some of the bigger networks and how that's all shifting and the opportunity that's there for you if you want to do this kind of work. So I'll pass it over to Tim, and I'll make sure he's mic'd up. No? Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. I have no slides. <laughs> No slides for anybody today, but I do have a, a big bag full of gadgets. So the first thing I'll do, just because I'm sure if, if I didn't open this bag, everyone's going to stare at it and just be dying to know what's inside it the whole time. One of the greatest mobile devices ever made. This is called Google Glass. I'm totally kidding. This is an old joke. But it is Google Glass. So if you've never seen one before, I do have one. Uh, I just thought that would be funny. 
So, in this bag, I have essentially everything you would need for, I, I, I couldn't imagine, there's, I could probably film a movie on this, right? I've got, a, I've got a 5D Mark III, I've got a gimbal for mobile, so you can put an iPhone in here, and I'll just give you a little demonstration, because I know that we saw a video of one. Hopefully this works properly, because I have more than one, and this is one that I have not used in a little while, but uh, you can tell I haven't used it in a little while. But you can see it stabilizes the phone, and I've got a different one here, which is probably a better example. But I've got two drones, believe it or not, inside this bag. I have a small DJI Spark and a Mavic. I have a Tascam recorder, batteries. So as you just heard, I did a 21-hour live broadcast from Occupy Wall Street. So. Before I start dissecting this and talking about everything, I'll just move over and just give you a, a brief explanation of who I am, what I've done, and everything that's uh, going on, I guess. So I grew up as a kind of roguish hacker, I suppose. I never finished high school. I went to college for about one quarter, and I kind of just traveled around, and I liked exploring, learning about things. And one thing that I've always done, as most millennials I'd imagine, is use social media. So I'm on MySpace. Facebook, Friendster, all those sites, many of which no longer exist, posting photos and explaining what I'm doing. That was just normal. And so one day, I was living in Los Angeles, and I decided to go visit my brother who was living in Virginia. I'm sitting in the living room, and he walks in and says, dude, did you hear that like thousands of people have stormed Wall Street? They're like trying to, like I don't know, like protest or take it over or something. And I'm like, yeah, I, I saw a video about that on Facebook or something. I just said, there's this video of this guy being dragged by, I think by his legs, I can't remember, it's been a long time, or by his arms, and the police are just ripping him out of this park. And so I thought, wow, I really want to go there. At this point, I'm just some guy, right? I, that I have no plans to do anything, to produce anything, and I have a laptop, and I have a, and I have a, a it was the Galaxy One, it was the original Galaxy phone. And so I start looking at the tickets, and 20 bucks will get you from Virginia to New York. And so I was like, all right, round trip ticket. It's going to be like 37 bucks. You get a bonus. You know, it's cheaper when you do a round trip. And then I thought, oh, you know what? I'm probably not going to want to stay at some camp in New York City for, a, for, a, for longer than a couple days. I should get a one-way ticket. That way I can leave in a few hours if it's absolutely crazy. I go, to, I go, I go there, and then sure enough, I, I spent five years in New York after that. <laughs> what ends up happening is when I'm, when I'm there, I start taking pictures. I start tweeting pictures. All of a sudden, everyone start, they start asking me on Twitter, what's going on? Oh, here's someone who's there. He's sharing photos. All of a sudden, my phone's blowing up with people saying, tell us more. Show us more photos, more videos. Well, my phone ran out of room. There was an app. It was called Ustream that allowed me to do a really low quality live broadcast. And so I decided not only, so there, there are concerns, right? If you get arrested, maybe the police will confiscate your memory cards as evidence, and you, you'll lose that footage. Well, if I do a live stream, then the footage is backed up online instantly. And so I don't, everyone's got it then. I mean, I want people to know what's happening here. I was working with a, a small group of, of people that wanted to, I, I guess they kind of wanted to make some kind of like media site out of what was going on. And we were sitting there discussing, okay, here's what we need. This is what the guy said, this is what, this is what happens in the meeting. We're gonna need a camera, okay? We need to figure out how do we do a live broadcast from here? Okay, we're gonna need like a video encoder and a laptop. How do we set that up? Okay, so we, we look at all this equipment, we, we go to the shop, we get a laptop, we get a, we get a camera, we get an encoder box, we start trying to figure out how to do all this, and then I look at my phone and I'm like, I, I could just download the app. I mean, there's no reason for us to buy all this equipment, I guess. And so we, I think we did one stream with a laptop and, and a computer and a camera, and then as we're sitting at the bar, I'm like, let me, let me try this app real quick. And then sure enough, we're, all of us were just like, okay, we don't need any of this equipment anymore. The, the, the cameras, the laptop, gone. And so what ends up happening is my rig ends up looking just like, just like this, a phone and a battery. And so I actually have another bag. This, this bag has enough in it to get aerial shots in slow motion, cinematic, beautiful 5D, you know, long lens, all the good stuff. But what happens when I actually need to go out, this is the bag that I've been using basically since I started journalism. 
I never intended to be a journalist. It was entirely an accident. But in here, it's simply just one more battery. And this is actually the first battery I've ever used from Occupy Wall Street. I don't really use it anymore, but I thought it'd be cool to bring with me today. It's kind of an example. And there's a few GoPros inside. As I struggle to put this away. So something interesting happened. And uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a beautiful and sad story. It's not really sad, but it's kind of frustrating for me in my life. Following Occupy Wall Street, hundreds of thousands, millions of people watched my live broadcast when Occupy Wall Street was evicted. And it ends up getting picked up by various television networks. And as I'm standing on the ground in New York, holding up my, my Android phone, filming the police as they make these arrests, people in the chat are telling me, because now I'm live, I'm interacting with the audience, something that's just unheard of when, when a live broadcast was happening. They're saying, your broadcast is live on Al Jazeera. Your broadcast is on the front page of time.com. And I'm just like, what, what is going on? I'm just some guy, and I have a phone. And all of a sudden now, I have television networks around the world broadcasting me standing here in New York simply because I had a phone and decided to press go live. And then sure enough, it gets even crazier. Somebody from time sees what's happening and says, we need to get a video about what's going on because this is like a mobile journalism revolution. There was a huge spike in interest in mobile journalism following that. And it has to do with the fact that the news trucks couldn't get inside the police perimeter. They couldn't get anywhere near it. They couldn't film. But not only that, doing the live stream the way I was doing it with thousands of people watching, I was talking to the audience in real time. And I was answering questions, giving them a, a good example, or I should say, a better understanding of what was actually happening. A ton of press emerges, and now I'm thinking, well, this was, an enti this was ent uh, entirely accidental. But if what I'm doing makes sense, and you can see there's a picture of me. This is in New York on May Day, I believe, in 2013. May Day is the big May 1st protests. Clearly, if the media is this excited about mobile journalism and they're, and they're saying all these great things about me, I'm going to be able to walk into any company and be like, let's do this. Let's take this idea in mobile journalism and make it work. And what did I discover? That's, that is in no way how business works. These companies did not want to touch it. There's too much liability, confusion. And look, when a bunch of companies already have big cameras, why would they reinvest even, in a, even a small amount of money for mobile technology? So there was a, there's a few interesting things that happened. I decided, you know what? A lot of companies talked to me. They said, why don't you come work for us? But did they really want to adopt mobile and do anything profound with it? Not really. It was more about the press. There was a lot of attention. People were saying, look at what he's doing. It's revolutionary. And so what they wanted was the buzz. They didn't actually want to fit all of their staff with phones. Well, it's expensive. You know, you got a staff of 1,000 people. You're going to buy 1,000 iPhones. We got big cameras. They work. Why should we change? So I decided I'm not going to entertain any, any of these offers. I'm going to keep doing my own thing. Eventually, I meet up with the editor-in-chief of Vice.com. And, he's, and he's, he's scratching his, his chin like, no, I think, I think you're right about this. I think if we do approach what you and, and anything you're doing, it should be about mobile. And it still took six months of talking with Vice to where they finally said, I remember like one of the last few meetings, they, they said to me, we don't, we don't do this. You know, we don't do mobile reporting on the ground. We don't do live. I mean, maybe we can hire you for one special event if something happens. And after some back and forth, they finally agreed, said, OK, here's what we'll do. We'll send you to Turkey. You go to Turkey, uh, Gezi Park protests. It was this big news event where protesters were staging, essentially, Occupy Turkey, I guess what a lot of people would refer to it as. Protesters had taken over a park, refusing to allow the government to bulldoze it to build a shopping center. So they say, just go. Just go, and we'll figure it out. And I went just with my backpack, my laptop, and my phone. They didn't, they didn't fit me with any special equipment. They called another journalist and said, go a photographer. They were like, shoot some videos of him doing his thing. And you know, let's see what happens. And so when I go to Turkey, you have machinery exploding. Tear gas cans littered all throughout the street. You're walking, and you're kicking cans. Bakeries selling baklava. People are running and crying covered in tear gas because this is an active conflict. People throwing Molotov cocktails. In one incident, a man got hit directly with a Molotov cocktail, threw his cameras in the air, and a water cannon sprayed him. It was intense. 
And I'm broadcasting this all on my iPhone, I believe it was my iPhone 4S at the time. I think this was, this was a while ago. And it, it broke a bunch of viewership records for Vice, for, a con for concurrent viewers watching a broadcast. And I come back to New York, and everyone's shaking my hand. They're like, wow, that was so amazing. And I have no idea why anybody in the office knows who I am. But it turns out they put my broadcast on every monitor in the Vice office. They had a live feed on the ground at this breaking moment, this historical moment from somewhere else in the world. And it was just me, as I always did, with my phone. So that, an interesting thing comes from there. It sort of, not only did it prove that what I did was valuable, that mobile journalism was cheap, effective, and something we should be, we sh we should be doing, but we also decided, let's expand on this. And so we created some live stream accounts. We actually upgraded some equipment. And some learning came out of this. Vice has a big, a big room full of all of the greatest cameras. If you, if you like B&H, you would love going to any one of these big companies and seeing all of the cameras they have. And so we decided, why don't we, look, if we got the people, why don't we say, we can, we can set up one of these really nice cameras with HD broadcasting, and then when we need to, when you know, a breaking event happens, we have our phones as backup. Essentially the way it would work. We give the staff phones, if a breaking news event happens anywhere near them, they can go live right away. But if we are preparing for an event we know we want to go live for, let's use the best equipment we can. And sure enough, we realized when you step up from a mobile device, which can cost you a couple hundred bucks, seriously, you can get a really good, a really, a great quality broadcast with a cheap phone, two, three hundred bucks. Cell phone plan, 60, 70 bucks. Now you want to step that up to a beautiful lens with 1080p, consistent, strong feed. Now you're looking at tens of thousands of dollars. The jump from being able to get the story in good quality to getting the best quality possible is a ridiculous jump in price. And so after we try using this new technology, it walks right back. And the moment happened actually around the time I left Vice. We're in Ferguson, and the riots were happening. And we had a C, I believe it was a C300, with a wireless encoder mounted on top, shoulder rig, and someone walking out with a camera, simply because we knew we were going to be there. And so if we can plan for it, let's do the best quality possible. And then as soon as that first tear gas can got thrown by a cop, I'm running full speed, pulling out my phone, plugged into a battery, and filming. Because there's no way, when you're dealing with a situation like this, that you're going to have a camera crew with a big camera running through the chaos. But there was another benefit to stepping it back. When we tried using the big cameras, because we thought quality was more important, we couldn't interact with the audience anymore. And that was a big step back, in my opinion. This was nearly two, uh, a year and a half, almost two years after I had started on the ground mobile interactive broadcasting. And here we are backtracking because we wanted to improve the quality of the video but from, 720, you know, from 480 to 1080. Well, 480p on a live broadcast, it's not bad. It's good. You can tell what's happening. We ended up going back to mobile. And mobile ended up being what made the most sense. But earlier, somebody brought up audio. I think you brought up audio. You were talking all about audio. And you're 100% right. When I was in, uh, so before Vice even, in 2012, there were protests in Chicago for, uh, against NATO. A lot of people came out. And there were clashes between the police. When you have a large group of people, cell phones kind of stop working. And you can't tweet. You can't really do anything. And it, and it's, it sucks. I'm live streaming in Chicago. And all of a sudden, my, the quality of my feed, it, it shows you the bit rate in the top corner of your app, starts dropping dramatically. People in the, in the comments not saying anything about it. The viewership is going up and up and up. And I can even see on my, on my phone, I'm like, something's not right. Why is the viewership going up when the quality has dropped to the point of you, you can't even watch this? And so I asked. I was like, hey, if, you know, for those of you that are watching, can you still see what's happening? I mean, the, I'm at like 100 kilobits per second. There's no way you're getting video. And then everyone says, oh, yeah, there's no video, but we can hear you loud and clear. They could hear me. And that meant that the viewership was increasing. If you have a live broadcast, actually, I can, let's, let's go all the way back in time. When I first started streaming, I got a phone call from my mom in, when I was in Occupy Wall Street. And she said, you know, I'm trying to watch these other live streams, but no one's saying anything. I don't know what's going on, so it's really difficult to understand anything. And so I was like, all right, I'll, I'll try and talk more when I do mine. You can see something on camera, but if you're not hearing 
you're not hearing from somebody, then you're not really getting anything out of it. And so then I really learned that the most important feature in producing, a con producing content, going live, producing mobile, is sound quality. Because if the video drops out, the amount of information you can receive that is specific, that helps you understand, is substantially greater through audio than through video. So uh, we'll look at some of the stuff that I have in here, I suppose. And I have a bunch of like bonus points. I was taking notes as we were uh, going through this. So I'll show you some stuff, and then I'll jump back to here. I wasn't keeping track of time. Are we? OK. <laughs> uh, and afterwards, feel free, if you guys want to come and see some of the crazy stuff I got in this bag, by all means. And I'm, I'm, this is in no way meant to endorse B&H, but I'm pretty sure they sell all this stuff. So if you guys know this, this is the uh, DJI Spark. I have the DJI Mavic, right? The Mavic is an amazing drone. It gets, I think, I think it's uh, 96 uh, frames per second. I have some drones that shoot 120 frames per second. But this is more than enough. The DJI Spark's really incredible. Aside from, I guess, producing uh, news and media and everything, I, I try to just be, I try to make everything. So I, with, with, all this in here, I was able to produce a 4K, 30-minute long mini documentary from the Berkeley protests when Ben Shapiro was at UC, uh, UC uh, Berkeley. And everything was it, that I uh, needed to do it was in here. So you know, I guess going back a little bit, when I have the opportunity, I try to do more than mobile. And that's why I have so much in this bag. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I also have the Asus, is what I use for editing. Yeah, so I'll, I'll talk about the GoPros for a bit. When you see, uh, GoPros are fantastic. I honestly, I shoot 90% of my prepared videos with just the GoPro 4. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not a big fan of the GoPro 5 or 6. But when, when I'm out in the field, let me, let me first start by saying this. Going out in the field, the first thing, and I, I swear, 99.9% .9 of anything just comes through the phone. And I'm a huge fan of the Galaxy S8. Probably one of the best cameras. I know I, I am in no way paid or anything by, 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 by uh, Samsung or anything. But I did a live stream on this phone, and it looked like I was filming with a DSLR. I was blown away. So if I go out, and I'm actually covering news, and I, and I would say this is true for all journalism. If any company is going to send out a journalist to report on the ground, it's with a phone. Sure, like I mentioned, uh, often when we know what we're going to do, we'll try and get a, a really nice camera so that we can produce it in really great quality. But if right now something happened in New York, I guarantee you, you're going to have 30 people out there from various networks going like this. You will, you will see some pro uh, photographers, their big cameras. You will see some cameras, because of course, we're in New York. But when you've got to get out there and the story's happening now, it's going to be on your phone. And I, I've got some friends of mine, one of them was sitting here, who insists on using a phone for everything. He's got nice cameras, but he's using a phone anyway. So I'll talk about, uh, a bit about GoPros, for those that asked. When you see interviews uh, on TV or in documentaries, usually what we'll do is we'll take uh, a different, I, I work with Canon most of the time. So a, a lot of times we'll have a C100, C C300. They're, they're beautiful cameras. Uh, 5D Mark III, or now the Mark IV. So 5Ds, you set them up on tripods, you do two different angles, one's pointed at your, your interviewee and one at the interview, interviewer, and then maybe you have a wide shot that shows them both. And then you do an edit where you blend the audio and you mix them both together. Uh, I, actually, I actually don't do that. I used to do that, and I might do it sometimes, but what I actually do is I take a GoPro and another GoPro and I just go like that. So I actually will set up it, it's, it's, it works. You know, why would I do anything else? I did an interview where I took a book, and I put a GoPro here and a GoPro here, just back to back, and you've got two beautiful high-definition shots, both of us. And, the, and, and I guess one thing that's really interesting when it, when it comes to audio, I just did an interview with some people. I was in a foreign country. I won't get too specific. And because it's so hard to capture really good ambient audio, I used my phone. And I, and I do this fairly often. Yes, there's really great microphones on the cameras. Yes, I have microphones. But sometimes it's really important to make sure you have a clean, ambient sound. And I will just turn my, my iPhone on to record and place it down. 
So GoPros, it's really simple. But another thing that I do have is the GoPro Karma Grip, and this is my absolute favorite. I showed you the other gimbal. It's old and I haven't really used it, so I, I apologize for it. But this one is really one of my favorites. Again, I want to preface everything with when I have the opportunity to know what I'm going to be doing, I will, I will bring a GoPro with me or, or a 5D, and then I can film myself and film others, and it makes it real easy. But as what I do is news, and often it's unpredictable, I have this big bag with me, and I won't bring it out. I'll fly to whatever city, say I beat the wildfires or some uprising, and this bag will just sit in my hotel room, because if something really happens, I take this and I take very little gear with me. A battery, maybe some lenses, and all of it is attached to mobile. That's, that's the gist of it. We're good on time? I'm sorry, I'm not. So I did make sure to keep, uh, keep a few extra points that, uh, just to make sure I don't miss anything. Ah, uh, okay. When it, you know what, when it comes to journalism, we still have so many companies that invest so much money in this really big equipment, and I just still don't know why. It's 2017. We talked about this stuff in 2011. And there was a story several years ago, and I was remind, I'm remind, reminded of these various things, you know, sitting here listening to these stories from the other speakers. There was a young woman, just a teenager, just this, this teenage girl in a mall, and a shooting happened. And no one knows what's happening when all of a sudden we start seeing tweets going viral. She was in the mall, and she was tweeting what was going on. No journalist in the world had access to this story. It was breaking. But this 16-year-old girl did, and so she instantly became the most important journalist in the world. And this happens all the time, simply for, because she had a phone and she was there. We all have phones now. And so to me, it's kind of like, is it, is it redundant? I mean, is it obvious when I say this? But one of the things that has always inspired me and has kind of been part of my philosophy for, for why I do what I do is let me just say, I am, I am not a fan of elitism. Uh, I consider myself a relatively lefty kind of dude. And I think that uh, I, I, really like, I really like how the internet has given an opportunity for everyone to start having a voice. And as it pertains to my work, this has to do more with the old broadcast tower is no longer a tower. It's falling down. It's becoming a field where, you know, back in the day, you have these big news companies that can afford $20 per minute to do a, sat, you know, a satellite broadcast out of whatever region. Well, what did I do? I went to Egypt. I went to Egypt for Vice. And this was during the, the revolution in 2013, uh, the second revolution. And they asked me, Tim, we got to get a live feed out of Egypt. What can we do? And I said, speak no more. I got this. And I took my iPhone. I took some uh, packing tape. And I took a tripod. And I had no mount, no mount for my iPhone. And so I taped it to the top. And I taped a battery to the side. And I pointed it off the balcony down at Tahrir Square. And we broadcast live from Egypt. And it cost nothing. Meanwhile, I looked, I looked across. This was at the Hilton in, in, uh, in Cairo. And I see someone's got a BGAN, uh, Broadband Global Area Network, one of these bigger things. It's aimed up at a satellite. And it's not getting as, as strong a connection as we are simply because all we need is the one megabit connection coming out of the hotel. We were able to pull it off. There are a lot of organizations that have started to emerge. Activist organizations have been able to create their own news entities, one of which is a group called Unicorn Riot. And so there's a, an old friend of mine, someone I've worked with, and, and he's an activist. His name's Lorenzo. And the stuff that they've been able to accomplish has been profound. They do have nice cameras, but they do a ton of, of live streaming through mobile, and they've always done it. Excuse me. During the Dakota Access Pipeline protests, they were probably the go-to source. They, I would consider them partisan, so for anyone who's you know, into news and politics, you, you keep that in mind when you watch them. But they were able to actually be there consistently, sleeping in the, in the, in the camp with their phones and, again, other cameras, but get a live broadcast out with, with the action that was going on. And a lot of what we've seen from these big breaking moments have been basically because somebody with a phone has decided to stand up and start documenting it. Which, which brings me to a more current, I guess we can come back to the, to the well, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll backtrack. I left Vice. I started working for Fusion. And we did essentially the same thing. We covered protests. We covered big events. And we used our phones. And at that point, it just became a staple. I'm going to go cover this protest in uh, Central Park. 
I'm just going to bring my phone into battery. And every, at this point, it was totally normal. I've had meetings with big broadcasters like the BBC and the CBC, and they're just, at this point, oh, yeah, of course. You're not using your phone? Well, you can't work here. I mean, everyone's got to have their phone. You've got to know how to use your phone. I will say the international community, Europe and at other places, are much more, they're quicker to adopt new technology, and I think the US is a little sluggish. But following you know, working for Fusion, I've gone totally independent. Now I am also a YouTuber, and I'm producing my own content on YouTube. I think as, as it pertains to the power of the individual and mobile technology and the, the barrier for entry being reduced, individuals can become more uh, more influential than big brands. We're starting to see just creators, just somebody who was in the right place at the right time or who took the initiative and picked up their phone, building bigger channels on their own or with one or two people compared to these big broadcast networks that have teams of 20 or 30. I still go out and I still see five people with big cameras, audio guys holding boom mics, and now I'm starting to see just regular people with a million subscribers who on their own or just between one or two people have managed to grow much quicker than these big companies with tons of money. Uh, we're still good? I, two minutes? So now I'm going to get philosophical for all of you and talk about two things that don't necessarily pertain to me, but I think I really want to say. There's something I discovered in my course in journalism that I think people don't realize about mobile technology. It has resulted in saving more lives than many other technologies. I don't, I'm not a, a doctor. But I talk to people, and one thing most people don't realize, before cell phones, if someone had an accident, if someone got hurt, how would you call emergency services? And so I've had a lot of conversations with people about the declining death rate for accidents, for, for crime. And what pe people don't realize is that mobile technology has dramatically changed the world in ways we haven't even considered. It's really easy for me to stand up here and talk about my work and say, oh, I use mobile technology to broadcast news because we're so used to it. We, we've seen these photos of somebody holding a phone and talking about the news. But when you realize that if right now you know, someone in New York slipped on a crack and you know, hit their head, there's 1,000 people who are going to pull up their phones and call 911 right away. Whereas before 2007, or I shouldn't say before the 2000s when cell phones became uh, prominent, you'd have to run and try and find a phone. Unfortunately, we do have to end it now. I really appreciate everybody for coming out and watching online and all of our presenters today. Hopefully, you guys got something out of it. And thank you, B&H.